Hey, this is Old Man Metal. Hope everyone's doing well, and welcome to the second episode of Old Man Metal's Musings, the official podcast of Old Man Metal. And thank you for joining me today, uh, and thanks to everyone who watched the first episode. If you missed it, I looked at five really great songs from 2018, uh, tracks from Feral, Hakata, Mentor, Rathrone, and Unleashed. So if you didn't catch that, check it out. Um, I enjoyed making it, got a lot of good feedback on it, and uh, so if you haven't seen it, give it a look. If you enjoyed it, make sure you gave it a like. Um, that helps with the algorithm on YouTube. Um, also, uh, if you are enjoying the content that I'm putting out, the little bit that I've put out so far, um, please go ahead and subscribe to my channel. Um, that helps with the algorithm on YouTube as well. Um, sitting here watching the autofocus thing track my face, that's kind of freaky. Um, anyhow, maybe I need to stop looking at it. So, uh, anyhow, I don't have a whole lot of content yet, so the YouTube algorithm, it's sort of like well, whatever, but you might as well do stuff right from the get-go. So, uh, just give likes if you like it, and follow if you want to follow, and that helps out. Um, so, we'll start today with a bit of an update. Um, I said in the afterword that I did to episode one that I was going to switch from 720p to 1080p, and that that was going to push me into a new laptop, and um, that is the case, and I've got the new laptop, and I've got all the software loaded on it that I'm going to use, and I'm actually using it right now for this episode. I've got it recording the uh, audio off my mic over here, and um, so far I'm pleased with it. I haven't done that much with it yet, um, so the proof's going to be in the pudding when it comes time to edit this video, but um, so far so good. And um, it's a Lenovo, and it's kind of funny because it's a model that Lenovo actually doesn't sell. It's the Legion Y7000, and its position is a gaming laptop. Um, and you can't buy it from Lenovo. It's a custom build that uh, they do custom builds for other uh, people to sell, I guess. And you can get it on Amazon, and you can get it on Walmart. Those are the two places that I know of that have it. Um, but you can't get it from Lenovo itself, which is, like I said, it's kind of odd, but whatever. Um, it's an Intel Core i7 um, with 16 gigs of RAM, which there could be more RAM on it. But for the price point that I was going for, I think 16 is going to get me the performance I need. And if not, it's easy enough to add later. Um, it's got an NVIDIA GE Force GTX 1060 graphics card. Um, and I think that and the, the, the additional power in the processor is what's going to make it do what I need it to do uh, versus what I was using. It's a dual drive system. It's got a 128 gig PCI solid state drive, and it's also got a one terabyte uh, regular old hard drive, HDD hard disk drive. And um, the idea behind that is you put the operating system and your software on the really fast SSD, and then you put all your data and everything on the other drive. And testing shows that if you do that, you get most of the speed benefit of the SSD um, without paying for the high price of the SSD to house all your data. Um, and also, supposedly, from what I've read, there's uh, some benefit to running, uh, running your software on one and your data on the other when you're doing read-write intensive stuff like uh, editing video and rendering video, which sort of makes sense. Um, so, anyhow, the design, the fit, and the finish on the laptop are really nice. The performance, we'll see um, once I start editing with it. But um, in terms of the, the research that I did on it, I'm sure it's going to be fine. Um, the price on Amazon is about $1,100, which is a few hundred dollars less than the price point on the other uh, different laptops that I was looking at. Um, and in most cases, the Lenovo had uh, some better specs anyhow. So um, that's the one that I settled on. I'm going to put a link to a pretty good review of it in the show notes below in case you want to take a look at it and um, learn more about it. And I also picked up a cheap video camera to use for my beer cam. Um, I would tried to use a beer cam on the, uh, the update that I did the afterward to episode one and I used an old uh, uh, Canon power shot that I had an old old one and it turns out that it would only film 30 second clips and I didn't realize that till after the fact so that didn't work as a beer cam and um, so I picked up a, an El Cheapo to do that um, it's a Cam Park ACT 74 action camera is the name that it's sold under and it's like 40 bucks on Amazon. It's Chinese manufacturer. The instructions are horrible. I mean, the worst English you've ever seen in your life. Um, but the price was right and it works. And when I looked at the reviews on it, what I figured out from looking was that basically this thing is a crapshoot. You're either going to get one that works or you're going to get one that doesn't work. And it seemed like it was about one in 10 that you were going to get a bum one. So I figure 40 bucks and I need something cheap to use as a beer cam. And this seemed perfect. So went ahead and bought one um, and it works. The USB only worked once. Um, I did a test the other night and went to... Uh, grab some uh, video off of it to take a look at it and I ended up having to um, 
uh, use a card reader because the USB connection has decided not to work. But for 40 bucks, I mean, you know, eh, whatever. Um, the maximum file length on it seems at uh, 1080p and 30 frames per second. The maximum file length seems to be about 18 minutes, but it just switches to a new file, so that's not a problem. I can splice them together. And as you can see, the video quality is not that great. You can actually see the curvature of the lens if you look up in the corners of the uh, the image, which I think is kind of funny and endearing for a beer cam, so uh, that doesn't really bother me that much. So for what I'm using it for, if it keeps working, it's worth the 40 bucks. Um, I feel bad for anyone who buys one of them thinking, hey, I'm going to get a great video camera for 40 bucks because no the fuck you're not <laughs> you're going to get a 40 dollar video camera for 40 bucks but like i said for a beer cam it's all good um i've got it mounted on an archon heavy duty camera clamp mount which i got off amazon for 28 bucks and that i do recommend um for the price it is friggin awesome it's not nearly as good as a manfrotto magic arm but for 28 bucks um it does what you needed to do if what you needed to do is hold a video camera stationary in pretty much any contorted position you want um, so I recommend that. Um, and all the gear that I'm using to make these shows is down in the show notes, and I've got links to all the gear on Amazon. Um, if you're interested in any of the gear and you decide that you're going to buy it, well, shit, click on the link below and uh, kick me a little piece of it. Um, that'll help my, my, uh, my content that I'm putting out. Yeah, content, that's what it's called. Um, so if you're going to buy the stuff anyhow, um, and you're going to buy it through Amazon, just click through the link, and you can't click through and bookmark it and come back and buy it later because they, they're not going to give me my cut if you do that. So anyhow, um, if you like the stuff and you're going to buy it anyhow, you might as well uh, support someone who's doing content that you enjoy. Um, so I get thirsty talking so easy, and it's hot as hell in this closet too. Jesus Christ. So, I said the next episode would be about my everyday carry knife. That's the Nakamura 44S. And um, I've got that episode researched. I've got it scripted. I'm ready to start shooting it and producing it. But like the first episode that I did, there's going to be a bunch of tweaky little segments that I have to pre-produce in OBS. And I know it's going to take me a while. And frankly, it took me long enough. It's been long enough since the last video. I don't want to lose any more momentum. So, I thought about it. And I said, well... I'm going to drop back and punt and just do another episode that's an easy one, just to shoot and edit like this one. And this one will be, well, there's a few pictures I'm going to put in here and there, but it's not going to be much. So, so that'll be the next one. Um, and um, that's why you didn't see the intro to this, too. Obviously, on the first episode, I had a really cool intro that I did. And um, this one just led right into the video. The intro is something that I'm going to have to reshoot. I'm um, going from 720 to 1080p. I'm just going to have to redo it. And it's going to take me some time to do it. So um, I'm going to do that uh, in time for the Nakamura episode, I'm sure. Um, but I'm not going to bother doing it for this episode. It's just going to take too long. Um, I am going to try to reshoot the show outro and the credits. That's pretty easy to do. Um, so I'm going to try to do that for this episode. So when you get to the end of the episode, if you see scrolling credits, you'll know. Um, so, 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 I guess that's the introductory stuff, and we're going to get on with the show now. The first order of business is going to be a look at a barrel-aged imperial stout that I've been cellaring for a few years, so I'm going to call this segment Out of the Cellar, and I've got a few other ones um, that I'm going to do the same thing with, I think. Um, so you ask the question, what is cellaring? Like some wines, uh, there are some styles of beer that actually benefit from being aged. Many don't, but some do. Um, the trick is knowing which is which. And uh, cellaring is just a beer snob term for storing beer in a nice, cool location to let it get some additional age on it. And I am a beer snob, so I can say cellaring. And I did. Cellaring. Uh, one style that usually ages really well is the Imperial Stout. And that's a big, bold, flavorful, dark style of beer. Um, it's usually got lots of complex roast character. And the ABV is usually pretty big, usually 9% or higher. It's actually, nowadays, usually 10% or higher. Um... And one of the more classic historic imperial stout styles is the Russian imperial stout. And that was a style of, for the time, a really, really strong stout that was brewed in the 1700s by Thrales Brewery in London. And it was exported to Russia to the court of Catherine II um, because they liked big, bold beers that were very strong. And so that's where it got the name Russian imperial stout. Uh, nowadays, a lot of breweries, they brew imperial stouts um, with adjuncts like coffee, chocolate, chili peppers, uh, tasty stuff like that. And so we call those American imperial stouts because they deviate from the original um, formula, the, the classic Russian imperial stout formula. And um, if you want to know more about imperial stouts, I'm going to put a link down in the show notes to the Beer Judge Certification Program notes on the style. Uh, so you can read up on that a little bit more if you want to. 
So why would you cellar an imperial stout? Well, there's two main reasons. Uh, one is to mellow the alcohol. Um, some of these imperial stouts, they come out, some of them are even as high as 13%. When they first come out, a lot of times they can be a little bit hot and um, not hot enough that they're horrible to drink, but hot enough that if you let them age and mellow out a little bit, it's just that much better a beer. Um, the other reason is maybe to round out or blend the flavors. Um, imperial stouts, like I said, tend to be flavorful. They have a tendency to have a bunch of big, bold flavors, especially if there's adjuncts like coffee in them. Um, so aging them lets those flavors round out a little bit, blend together a little bit, and you get more of a seamless um, feel to the flavor on the beer. Uh, so that's another reason to do it. Um, the third reason to do it is just because you like trying stuff, and it's uh, what happens if I age this beer? How does it change? Well, the way to find that out is do it. Um, so that's another reason. Um, but mainly people do it to mellow out the alcohol and to, to let the flavors blend a little bit. And I think with wine, it's probably the same. I don't know. I don't drink wine. Don't care about it. Um, but I imagine it's probably the same type thing. And one of the things that breweries like to do is aged finished stouts in bourbon barrels. That's a really big thing. And if you pay any damn attention to the craft beer world at all, you know that because bourbon barrel aged stouts are everywhere. Um, sometimes they use other kind of barrels, wine barrels, whiskey barrels, this, that, and the other. And no, whiskey is not the same as bourbon necessarily. Um, but a lot of times it's bourbon stouts. And um, so you get some bourbon notes and some oak notes. Um, and if you are uh, aging in American oak, you get some oak lactones that sort of come across as, uh, as coconut too, which is kind of weird, but um, that's how it works. Um, and that's what we've got today that we're going to look at. And uh, this is the 2016 release of Founders KBS, um, which is short for and I know I just leaned across the microphone talking. I'm sorry, I'm trying not to do that. It probably just sounded like crap for a minute there. Um, that is the beast right there, Founders KBS. That is short for Kentucky Bourbon Stout. And that's what it is. It's an imperial stout um, that has been aged in bourbon barrels. It was originally brewed with chocolate and uh, coffee as well. Um, so they call it a breakfast stout. A lot of times if stouts are uh, fairly good sized and they're brewed with coffee, they will call them a... Uh, they will call them a coffee or a breakfast stout rather. So that's sort of what they're playing on here. Kentucky for the bourbon, breakfast for the coffee. And um, this is a once a year release. Um, it's always one of their more anticipated beers and it just slays year after year after year. And we're gonna move this coffee and get it out of the way. And uh, so KBS just, uh, it's, it's one to look forward to. It's great every year and um, I really like uh, Imperial Stouts. I drank a fair amount of them, so I have a tendency to, when something nice comes out, poke a few of them back, you know, buy a four-pack or an eight-pack and, you know, over the year drink them and then have a few sitting back uh, cellaring. And so that's what happened with this one. And um, this one came out in 2016, and I've actually got a review that I did of this one in 2016, and I purposefully have not looked at that, but I'm going to pull that up and go through it after we do the tasting notes here. Um, and if you look on the back label, and you're not going to be able to see it on the camera probably, um, it's right there where you see the white etching on the yellow. Um, and you probably, like I said, aren't going to be able to see it. And that's cool um, because I've got a picture of it that I'm going to drop in. And um, it's 12.4% ABV, so it's nice and big. Um, it was bottled February 12th of 2016, so it's three years, five and a half months old. And that's probably longer than anyone with any sense is going to sell her an Imperial Stout. Usually, I've found my experience, the sweet spot is somewhere between one year and two years. So this one's probably gone a bit longer than it needed to. But we're going to see. We're going to find out. And I would expect at this point in time, you're going to see that most of the coffee has come off. It's going to be a lot less boozy than it was, probably less bourbon character. Um, the flavors are going to be more blended. And it's probably going to be sweeter, too. Um, we'll find out, though. So I use the uh, ASTMO methodology when I, reviews beer, when I review beer, and that is appearance, smell, taste, mouthfeel, and overall. So that's what we're going to do. And... Um, I'm a believer in proper glassware, so this is going to seem kind of blasphemous, but the fact of the matter is, and I've got about 250, 260 beer reviews on Beer Advocate, um, I got really into it for a couple of years, working on my palate, my vocabulary, my ability to talk intelligently about beer, communicate the experience of, of drinking it, um, and I found that in doing the reviews and doing the tasting notes in particular, uh, juice glass is the way to go because, number one, it's standard and you're comparing beers to each other, so using different glassware really isn't fair. And 
also the way I pour, and you'll see I'm only going to pour about halfway up, you get a really nice vapor space over top of it. And um, it just, I, I've always found, lets me get uh, really good notes on the, uh, on the aroma from the beer. And uh, so we're going to do this live. I've never done a video of me doing beer tasting. I've hardly done videos of me at all. So it's going to be interesting to see how much of a douchebag I look like um, doing this. But anyhow, it is what it is. So we're going to pop this rascal, and um, I'm just going to note uh, 2016. Um, that's a long ways back. <clears throat> My father was still alive when I bought this beer, um, and that's been a minute. So, And I'm not expecting a whole lot ahead, um, number one, because of the style, and number two, because it's been sitting for a while. So I'm not going to really get concerned about that. So looking at the appearance, actually, that's a, that's a pretty decent head there, um, considering everything, considering the glass that it's in and the style normally, you know, head's not something that you, that you necessarily go for a whole lot on this style. Um, and I'm in really poor lighting here and I've got a light in my face, so I can't really tell the color, except I can tell you it's an Imperial Stout, so it's black. Um, and one of the things that I like to do is take a light and this sort of helps you judge how black it is. And I'm going to see if I can see it on the camera. So this is a this is a 30 lumen white that I'm shining through it. And you can see it's a bright little white. And that white that you're seeing at the top of the beer is actually not the white. I'm down at the bottom with it. Um, so looking at that, I can't even see that white through there. So you're going to call that as dark as it gets, which is, uh, which is an 80. Um, SRM. And so right off the bat, just coming up on it, you get the coffee a little bit, you get a little bit of bourbon, you get a little bit of booze. So I'm going to say it leads with, with coffee and bourbon. And behind that, I'm really just getting uh, some caramel and some chocolate. I'm not getting a whole lot of big, big nose off of it like I might necessarily have when it was newer. So, leads with bourbon, leads with coffee, and then back behind that, you've got some chocolate, some caramel. Um, not really a whole lot of distinct flavor notes. Hmm. And that really tastes a, a lot like what I expect KBS to taste like. Um, more bourbon than I thought would still be left. That's actually a fairly good amount of bourbon on there. I'm going to be interested to see how much there was to start with. Um, KBS, usually, you get a lot of caramel. You get the chocolate. I'm really not picking up any coffee on the flavor at all, hardly. And I wouldn't expect to at this point, three and a half years out. Coffee is one of the things that usually will come off fairly easily off a of beer. Um, and KBS on the... Usually the caramel is like a lighter caramel, and I don't mean light in intensity. I mean like light-colored caramel as opposed to a darker caramel. Um, this is tasting a little bit darker than I remember it. It's, it's got the lighter caramel, some darker caramel, um, a little bit of molasses, um, which is really a, a dark, dark sweet, and not even that sweet necessarily. Still got a fair amount of bourbon. I'm going to say not much coffee. Um, so about what I would expect it to taste like. Um, probably was a little bit better a year ago. It's absolutely not bad now, but after a certain point, it's diminishing returns, and I probably should have drunk this one already. Um, but it is what it is. Um, so the mouthfeel, let's get a feel of that. It's fairly viscous. Um, Imperial Stouts have a tendency, some of them, to be fairly thick. This is not the thickest one I've ever had, but it's got a good bit of viscosity to it. Um, it's sticky. It's got a sticky feel. And, um, you know, and not to be crass, but what I mean by that is if I drink some of this and I hawk a loogie on the wall, it's going to stick to the wall. That's what I'm trying to say. It's got a really sticky feel. There's some sugars there that are making it cling. Um, and um, the... Uh, 
the booze, it's not really that boozy. Um, I'm going to say that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's warming, not anywhere near what it would have been probably when it was fresh because it's 12.4%. That's a good bit. But um, it's warming, and the carbonation... You can feel the carbonation a little bit. It's not that it's not that prickly, not that strong. And honestly, carbonation to me with an imperial stout, even a new stout, is not that big a deal. My thing with mouthfeel on an imperial stout is I want to um, I want to feel the viscosity. I want it to feel thick. I want it to have a good full mouthfeel, and this definitely does have a good big full mouthfeel. Um, and, uh, overall, yeah, like I said, um, I probably didn't need to sit on this one quite as long as I did, but it is good. Um, and it's actually very good and I'm going to enjoy drinking the rest of it. And I'm going to do that the right way. <sighs> and that's the proper glassware in my book for an Imperial Stout, just an old brandy snifter. And the great thing about a brandy snifter is you can go to any damn Salvation Army or Goodwill or thrift store you want to, and there's probably a dozen of them sitting on the shelf, and they're probably 50 cents a piece. You pay through the other, pay through the nose for other good glassware, but um, as far as uh, brandy snifters go, they're pretty cheap, pretty easy to come across. If you don't have a brandy snifter, you got a red wine glass, that's fine too. I mean, there's obviously not a huge difference between a good red wine glass and a brandy snifter, um, so you can do that too. Um, like I said, I think glassware is important, and maybe we'll talk about that in another episode. Not going to bother talking about it now. And shift things around a little bit. So we're going to change gears here. Um, we're going to go from good beer to good metal, and it looks like we're about uh, 22 minutes in. So, God damn, I can talk. That's a fact. This is going to be a fairly long one. But it is what it is. Hope you all are sticking with me. Um, Hope you're not jealous of the good beer. Hope you're drinking a good beer, actually. Um, and I'm just going to say uh, cheers to the folks at Founders for making it. Cheers to the folks at Hay Beer for bringing it into North Carolina and providing it for me to purchase and stick away in my cellar for three and a half years or the back of my closet, as it were. And cheers to you. And like I said, I hope you're drinking a good beer. And if you're not, Pause the damn video and go get one. That's the great thing about this. You can pause the video, go get another beer, go get this beer, go get your first beer, whatever. Go get a good damn beer. And uh, while we're talking about this next segment, drink your good beer with me. Um, so like I said, we're going to shift beer. Uh, tsh, shit, we're going to shift beers a bit. We are going to shift gears. We're going to go from good beer to good metal. And we're going to look at what I think are the top five front runners right now for album of the year. My opinion, not necessarily yours. Um, no particular order. I just looked and I said, these are the top five on the list that are fighting for that top spot. And we're going to talk about them a little bit and, um, give you some stuff to check out. I'm going to put links, um, in down in the show notes. Um, I said, I'm trying to keep this episode short, so I'm not going to do samples or any of the stuff that I did on the first episode. I am going to go back and do episodes where I do that type of thing. Absolutely. Because people really enjoyed it and I enjoyed doing it that way. Um, but like I said, trying to push this one out. Um, just want to go ahead and get it done. So I'm not going to do any samples. What I am going to do, all five of these albums are on YouTube in their entirety. So in the show notes below, I've got a link to all of them. So go and listen to them. Listen to them for free. Check them out. I mean, that's the wonderful thing about music nowadays. I don't do blind buys on albums ever. And I mean, I'm about to be 50 years old. I'm coming up on 50. When I was coming up, a lot of what you did was blind buys because you couldn't get on the internet and check stuff out or even get on the internet and read reviews. So take advantage of the fact that you can check these things out. You know, I think they're great. I think you'll think they're great, but maybe you won't. And um, so if you, if you find out, then you'll know. Um, so the first one we're going to look at is uh, from a band called Ravenous Death. And I'm going to throw an image up here, too. I'm going to try to get some decent video right there, but I'm going to throw an image up there, too. Um, so that is Ravenous Death. The album is called Chapters put the put the used ones at I'm running out of space here I need like a second desk to set shit on it seems like um so ravenous death chapters of an evil transition ravenous death is a fairly new band they were formed in 2016 um but none of the members are new to the mexican death metal scene which is what they're part of um they've all been in previous bands 
Chapters of an Evil Transition is their first LP. They had a EP come out on an indie. It was an indie independent. Um, it was called Ominous Death Cult. Um, that was 2017. So 2019, their first album comes out on the Memento Mori label. Um, and this is generally up-tempo black death metal that uses a lot of blackish tremolo picked riffing, uh, as well as some more traditional old-school Swedish death metal riffs and the occasional thrash break. Um, all of that's driven by equal portions of D-beats and double bass, and there are some blastier sections and some thrashier drumming as well. Um, there are lots of nice feel and tempo changes that keep things exciting, and plenty of riff changes too, even within the verses and choruses, and that's not something that you always get necessarily. Uh, the vocals are cavernous, guttural bellows, and occasionally there are some blackish snarls and shrieks. Uh, the production is also blackish in tone, but it's still big feeling. Um, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel um, like there's no low end to it, like a lot of times with uh, blackish production you'll get. Um, it's big feeling, it's modestly dirty. Honestly, it sounds really nice. It's a really good sounding album for what it is. Um, as far as the standout tracks go, there aren't really any standout tracks. It's consistently good throughout. Um, maybe Doom to Exist and Initiation Ritual don't stand out as much as the rest of them do. Um, but great album. Check it out. Um, the next one, I'm getting better at not talking when I'm leaning. That's good. At least my dumbass can learn. Um, this is a CD, and I'm looking at the white reflecting off of it and trying to get it at an angle where it's not going to catch that white so bad. And I guess it doesn't matter because I'm going to put an image up there anyhow. So we'll just go straight to the image. The hell with it. And uh, Warfist is a two-man Polish black thrash band, and they've been around since 2004. Uh, Grunberger is their third full-length release, and it comes to us courtesy of Gods of War production. Um, it is a really well-done multi-tempo black thrash album in the vein of Toxic Holocaust, that type thing. Um, th you've got excellent, well-varied mid- and up-tempo thrash riffs, and they ride atop some traditional thrash drumming, bolstered by D-beats and double bass uh, where necessary, but predominantly thrash-style drumming, thrash-style riffing. Um, Warfist make really nice use of really crushing down-tempo sections and breakdowns uh, for build and release of tension and keeping things interesting. And they also use the occasional thrash lead or a groove bit or a gang chorus or a crossover riff. They throw all sorts of different things in there for variety, so that keeps it really interesting, and that's one of the things that I really like about the album. Um, the production is fairly blackened and dirty, and it reminds me a lot of mid-era Toxic Holocaust. I mentioned them already as a reference point. Uh, the vocals are hoarse, gruff, spoken bits and shouts, and really they remind me of Deceased as much as anything else. Um, so the vocals don't remind me of Toxic Holocaust so much. But um, standout tracks, I'm going to say The Chapel of Death, uh, The Burning Flames of Ignorance, which is a great fucking title, and Grunberger, Drinking with the Devil. And that's one of those songs where you've got like a second subtitle in parentheses, and I always thought that was cool. Um, so it's always cool to see someone do that. So. And it looks like my main camera just stopped. I guess there's some sort of file length limit on it. And 28 minutes in, that's kind of a weird limit. So anyhow, I just told it to start recording again. And um, I think I was closing out with Grunberger, um, Drinking with the Devil being one of the standout tracks. And I was saying, well, uh, cheers to you too. So the third album we're going to look at... It's like magic. It just keeps refilling itself. It's like the never-ending glass of beer until I get done with it. So the third one we're going to look at is an album by a band called Occultist. The album is called Reinventing Evil. And Occultist, Occultist is a fairly new death metal band from Portugal. Um, according to Metal Archives, they formed in 2016. Um, one of the guitarists and the drummer were in a previous band, but the other three members, Occultist is their first band, so these guys are really new. Um, and other than an EP called Eye of the Beholder that they put out in 2017, Reinventing Evil is their first output, and it's certainly their first uh, full length. And it's out on Alma Mater Records, and it is a beast of a debut. I mean, if you're a new band and you put something like this out as your first album, you should be proud of yourself because it's really good. Um, and what it is is really thrashy, blackish death metal, um, and it uses a lot of groovish and thrashy feel and tempo changes to break up the mid and ump tempo 
tremolo pick death metal riffing. So there's a lot of traditional tremolo pick death metal riffing, but they um, throw in some thrashy sections and some groovy sections, and there's a lot of feel changes and tempo changes uh, to keep things interesting. And they also use a few more traditional sections here and there, not every song, um, and those range in feel from Nevermore to Danzig to Alice in Chains, so definitely some other influences at play other than just death metal and thrash, um, even though that is the foundation of what they're doing. Um, the guitar work includes some really, really nice thrash leads and some really nice traditional leads, too, and lots of pinch harmonics. And I mean shit tons of pinch harmonics. Like, Randy Rhodes would be jizzing all over the place for all these pinch harmonics. And I think that's a great thing. Um, you know, I guess you can overuse them, but the fact of the matter is you've got to go out of your way to overuse pinch harmonics in my book. I love them. It's like the exclamation point of metal, so that's a good thing. Um... In the drumming, they use a lot of traditional rock and thrash structures. Um, predominantly, there are some double bass runs and the occasional D beat that you see coming in from the uh, the death metal side of things. Um, but by and large, traditional drumming, thrash drumming. Um, the vocals have a black, raspy, growlish timber, and they're spoken or spit. Um, and the production has a nice raw, blackish feel to it. And uh, so. It sounds really good. The material's really good. It's interesting. Um, and like I said, they use really good use of uh, tempo change, especially going down tempo, breakdown, stuff like that. Um, stuff that'll just snap your damn neck. So definitely worth checking out. And I got to not tap the table either because the mics pick that up like hell. So that's a dumb thing to do. Um, and the standout tracks, I would say I Am the Beast, um, Plasmodium Nocturnus and Rise and Rain um, of, of the tracks on the album. I would say those stand out maybe a little bit more than the others. Um, so the fourth one we're going to look at, and hopefully you know who these guys are. I really hope you know who these guys are. A little band called... Yeah, this holding up the CD thing is just not working good because of the damn light. Oh, there we go. Get it angled like that. I don't know. Anyhow, I hope you know who Legion of the Damned are because they are one of the seminal death thrash bands. Um, they've been around since 2005, and before that, they were a band that was called a cult, and that band formed in 92, so they really have been around for a long damn time. And the drummer and the vocalist all actually go all the way back to the beginning of a cult, so, you know, those guys have been doing it for a long time. And as far as I'm concerned, Legion of the Damned is the perfect exemplar of Death Thrash. Like, if someone asked me, what the hell is Death Thrash? I would hand them a copy of uh, their first uh, their first full-length release, um, Malevolent Rapture. That's it right there. And that sucked, so I'm going to do that again. It's the first thing I've reshot. Actually, I'm not going to do it again. Actually, I will. Fuck it. Um, as far as I'm concerned... Legion of the Damned is the perfect exemplar of Death Thrash. Like, if someone asked me, what the hell is Death Thrash, I'd hand them a copy of Malevolent Rapture, which is their first album that came out in 20, uh, 2005. Um, they're, just, they're just that good and uh, that big a deal. And uh, so in January, they had a new album come out on Napalm Records. It's called Slaves of the Shadow Realm. It's their seventh full-length album, their seventh LP, and the first one they've done in five years. So it's actually been a bit of a hiatus for them. Um, and as you would expect, if you know the band, um, Slaves of the Shadow Realm is absolutely top-notch death thrash. Absolutely top-notch. And as always with their stuff, it's primarily mid- and up-tempo thrash riffing. Um, the occasional tremolo pick death metal passage for contrast. All the neck-snapping riff and tempo changes that you expect out of good thrash, those are all there. And that's one of the things that I love about them is they will wreck your damn neck like nobody else. Um, the drumming follows suit is primarily drawn from, from thrash with some occasional death metal bits. Um, same thing as the guitar work. Uh, the song structures, importantly, are more like death metal than the traditional verse, chorus, verse, chorus, thrash simplicity. That's one of the things about thrash is typically it's verse, chorus, verse, chorus, or some minor variation on that. Death metal, you get into some weirder structures, um, maybe more linearity. There may be choruses, but there are multiple choruses. The verses don't work out the same. And uh, so that's one of the things that you see a lot with Death Thrash is you won't see the traditional thrash structures. You might see traditional thrash riffing and drumming and some other death metal elements, but typically the song structuring will be more drawn from death metal. And that's the case with Legion of the Damned. 
Um, the production aesthetics, just like always for Legion of the Dam, they sound the same as they always do. Um, blackish, that type of early black thrash, kind of a little bit tinny like old thrash was. Um, black, a little bit raw, definitely how it sounds. Um, another great album from a consistent ass kicker of a band. So if you haven't heard it, you need to check it out. It came out in January, and I actually didn't click onto it for a couple of months. Um, it, it slipped past me somehow or other, but as soon as I got my hands on a copy of it and checked it out, absolutely wonderful. So, um, Standout tracks are going to be Slaves of the Southern Cross, Warhounds of Hades, and Black Banners in Flames, which is another really cool song title. And last, but certainly not least... That is really good, but probably not as good as it was a year ago. Anyhow, last but not least is something that I thought that we would never see. Chicago's Usurper is one of my favorite black thrash bands. Um, always has been. They started out in 94 with a demo, and their first LP, Diabolosis, in 95 was pure black thrash with emphasis on black. It was pretty damn raw pretty heavily influenced by black metal. Um, their second album wasn't maybe quite as raw. The third one came out in 2000. It was called Necronemesis, and that one saw them hit a balance between the black and the thrash that nowadays draws a lot of comparisons to Celtic Frost. And, yeah, I know it's Celtic, um, but even Tom G. Warrior has admitted to the fact that he occasionally uses the endearing Americanism Celtic, and that's what we called it back in the day, and so that's what I'm going to say. Celtic. Duck, I says. It was a great movie. Um, so Usurper released five albums, and the fifth one saw the departure of General Diabolical Slaughter, who was their vocalist, and he was fucking amazing. Go back and check out some of their early stuff, the stuff that he could do. Great vocalist. Uh, so in 2005, he was replaced by uh, Dan Tyrantor uh, on the Crypto Beast album, and I always thought Dan did a really good job. His voice was different. He... Um, did not sound like the general. His phrasing was different. He sang things differently. But he had a really good voice, and I always felt he did a really good job. And I think most people did, too. So, the general leaves. Crypto Beast comes out in 2005. It's a good album. Everyone's happy. And then they split up. It's just done. And it sucked, but shit happens. Good bands break up. Your favorite bands break up. And I'm not going to claim them as a favorite band, but certainly that style, one of my favorite bands... Um, and after a few years of being broken up, you figure it's for keeps. And if after a decade, you figure, shit, it's done. Forget about it. There's, you know, it's, it's done. 14 years after they split up, 14 fucking years later, Usurper comes out with a new album. And that's this year. And uh, it's called Lords of the Permafrost. Never thought it would happen. Never thought there would be another Usurper album. And I, honest to God, think that the new album compares to Twilight Dominion, which is my favorite album from them. By any any measure, it's a hell of a comeback album. It's an absolutely fantastic comeback album. And the funny thing to me about it is how much Tyrantor sounds like General. Um, the timbre of his voice is still a little bit rougher, but it's a lot closer to the way the General sounded, and the f enough that you like notice it when you listen to it. And the phrasing is spot on general. The phrasing, he's not singing it the way he sang on Crypto Beast. I swear the phrasing, it's so much like the general that I had to check the credits to be sure who was singing. I figured maybe the general had been chain smoking for the last 14 years and his voice had roughened up or something a little bit. It's like the whole band took this big step backwards to Twilight Dominion. And that's, like I said, my favorite album from them. So I'm just over the moon the fact that they dropped this new album, got back together, and it's as damn good as it is. Um, I'm really digging it. And if you like Usurper, you, you need to check it out because you're probably going to dig it too. Um, just absolutely fantastic stuff. Just as excited as I could be that they did that. Um, so that's going to about wrap it up um, at the 39-minute mark. Good God Almighty. God, I can talk, y'all. So um, I hope you enjoyed listening to me talk, um, talking about some new gear. Uh, 2016 Founders KBS Stout. Um, yeah, I'm a little OCD, uh, if you caught that. Um, some new metal from Ravenous Death, War Fist, Occultist, Legion of the Damned, and Usurper. And like I said, those five albums right now, to me, they're leading the pack in terms of what's going to be album of the year. That can change. It's only August, August 1st. 
Um, but that's where we're at. Um, if you did enjoy the episode, please leave a like. Um, the next episode should be the Nakamura Everyday Carry Knife episode. Um, if you're not subscribed, make sure and subscribe so that you get a notice. You don't miss out on that. And um, appreciate the support. Interested in any comments, anything you've got to say, please comment down below. Um, I get a handful of comments because obviously I'm just starting out, so I definitely read every single goddamn one of them. Um, so like, subscribe, comment, join in. Um, if you're not following me on Twitter, that's the best way to keep up with me at Old Man Metal OG. And um, I'm on there every day talking about metal, talking about beer, talking about other stuff, mostly metal and beer, mostly metal. Um, so follow me on Twitter, join me on Twitter, and a lot of good people on there that I run around with talking about some good metal, so it'd definitely be worth your while. And um, in closing for this time, I am Old Man Metal, and thanks again for joining me, second episode of the podcast. If you enjoyed it, tell your friends. If your friends don't like it, get new friends, because they don't know what the shit they're talking about. And until next time, keep those horns up high. Y'all take care. listening to Old Man Metal's Musings. All material depicted is the intellectual property of the copyright holders. Any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is a goddamn shame. Thank you for joining us.